Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. Thanks for ti taking time out of your day to join us. I'm Jenna Kirsten, your moderator for today's webinar, and I'd like to welcome you to this session on high trust scoping. Let's go over a couple of things before we dive into our discussion. All attendees will be muted throughout the se session, but we do encourage you to ask questions using our Q&A feature, which is located in the WebEx toolbar. I'll monitor those throughout the hour, and we'll have some time reserved at the end to answer any questions. This session is also being recorded, and all attendees will receive a link to the recording as well as a copy of the slides in your inbox tomorrow, so be on, be on the lookout for that. Just a little bit of background about who we are before we get started. Kirkpatrick Price is a licensed CPA firm providing assurance services to clients worldwide. Our firm has over 13 years of experience in information assurance by performing assessments, audits, and tests that strengthen information security and compliance controls. We offer both regulatory compliance and information security services. We provide consulting services such as policy and procedure drafting, risk assessment, internal audit plan and development, and readiness audits. We also provide guidance and audit services on frameworks such as SOC 1, 2, and SOC for cybersecurity. PCI DSS, HIPAA, HITRUST, FISMA, ISO, and also GDPR. We also encourage you to connect with us by subscribing to our blog, visiting our library of recorded webinars so you can catch up on any series at any time, and following us on LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook. Now I'd like to introduce our speaker for today. We have Shannon Lane with us. He's one of our information security specialists and has over 20 years of experience in information services. We are lucky to have him. He's on the 2018 High Trust DSF Assessor Council and holds all the certifications that I'm not even going to try to pronounce. <laughs> so welcome, <laughs> Shannon. Hi there, folks. Uh, thank you for joining us today. I look forward to uh, I look forward to talking with you and to working with you on High Trust scoping today. Um, First things first, as I, am, uh, as I am fond of saying, I'm not an attorney. We are not attorneys. This is to educate, to inform, and hopefully empower you guys to make good decisions around high trust. This is not legal advice. If you, if you have regulatory issues or legal concerns, be sure to talk to your attorney. So today, today we are going to talk about scoping. And we have an hour to do that today. And I'm going to be honest with all of you, scoping is one of those things in high trust that uh, I can talk about for days. So even with an hour to sit and talk through some general scoping expectations, uh, I think you're going to find that it's still a fairly surface conversation. There's a lot to dig into here. But we're going to try to get through three major topics today. We're going to talk about high trust and how it expects you to scope your systems what systems boundaries are and the definitions of them within your organization. And then we're going to walk through the scoping demographics that high trust posts for your auditor and for you to determine what uh, requirement statements you all will need to do for your high trust audit. By the end of the discussion, I hope you guys will have at least a very basic resource to make informed decisions around your own scope. Um, we're going to have we're going to have some general conclusions and then have some space in there to answer any questions you all may have. And let me say, I really encourage you guys to ask every question you can think of. We're going to try to get to all of them today, and I think there's a lot of ground to cover. So I'm not sure where I need to deep dive. Let me know in the Q and A if you would. Scoping everything that you do in high trust. Once you've made the decision to use the CSF for your compliance activity, everything you're going to do from that point on with high trust is going to be all about your scope. In fact, uh, I think we said in our first presentation that there's no more fundamental issue you must resolve as part of your high trust activity than to determine your scope. To that end, understanding how you use data is fundamental to understanding your scope. And I want to emphasize that in its advice to assessors, High Trust tells us that they're not terribly interested in certifying your entire organization. If you would, think like a hospital. Hospitals are collections of systems. There's radiology, there's um, cytology, there's microbiology, there are doctor-patient interactions and inpatient, outpatient, surgery. 
And every single one of those is an incredibly complex, detailed entity. And it would be tremendously difficult to certify an entire hospital around high trust. Not impossible, but very, very difficult. High trust wants to certify things based on the processes you define. For example, they would love to certify a hospital EMR, which would allow all of your patients, uh, all of your patients, all of your doctor's offices and subsidiary organizations to use that EMR with a reasonable assurance that all of the security controls are in place around that EMR. <clears throat> Similarly, they'd love to do a radiology department for much the same reason. But to do an entire hospital is a vastly different undertaking. So speaking about boundaries, everything starts with defining the walls that go around the scope you want to have certified. In, the, in their fundamental state, system boundaries are around three major ideas. What systems do this process, whatever that happens to be. And by the way, when we are using the word system here, we're using it like in a, a CPA uses the word system. This is people, process, and technology. So what people are there? How do they interact with your servers? What systems actually do the thing we want to certify? That's your process. Storage. When data is involved, where are you keeping it and how? Remember that any form of data these days makes no distinction between physical data on paper, um, uh, data that you are deriving from other sources or primary source data from databases or customer or client demographics. If you have data, where is it? And then transmission of data. What devices, protocols, or systems move that data between the various components of your system or in interactions with your clients? How do people give you the data to process if you're a processor? How do you derive it if you are a primary entity? Um, how do you get it out to people so that they can use it? Those processes, those points of transmission, define the boundaries of your system. The last two pieces on this are the boundaries of control around what we've just built. If we imagine um, the walled garden being defined as your people, your process, your technology, the data you store, and how you move it around. The next question we ask is, how do you maintain those systems? This is patch management, risk assessment, HR. Where do these controls come into play around the systems that you're defining? And then, are there any systems that can affect its security even though they're not part of our defined scope. This can include Active Directory infrastructure, RADIUS servers that are used across the entire environment, even wireless networks that would otherwise be out of scope but are connected in such a way that they um, can hit a primary domain controller or a data storage system directly. In order to define your system, in order to sit down with your assessor and validate your conclusions around your primary scope, there are essentially four major documents, four major uh, processes that you need to be a hold up, to get a hold of. You're gonna need your data flow diagram, understanding how things flow through your network. This is going to identify your transmission points, both internal and external, and between systems, what protocols you use to call between those systems. Um, it identifies where your clients speak to you, where you speak to them, <clears throat> and what you do internally. Where do the people intersect that particular process? Your network diagram defines how everything is connected to make the data flow diagram work and is fundamental to understanding how your environment fits together. This is where we're going to find things that are connected to that may impact the security of. Your system inventory. Things like uh, AWS's um, uh, elastic containers have a different ramification than a static set of metal servers. 
hypervisors, things that control other things within your uh, systems need to be documented. How are you enforcing things like TLS between one place and another? Uh, is that built into your network? Are you guys building it on the switches? Do you have ACLs that define what can talk to what? That inventory will help us understand exactly what's involved within your scope boundary. You'll also need it later on for assessment, and it's one of the most important documents you'll produce. And then system management procedures. Arguably the biggest and hardest thing to get out of the bunch how are you managing these systems? Where is the patch server? Who handles the risk assessment and how do they know what's built into that environment? Um, where are your primary software repositories? Where do you keep your backups? Those things fall into the management of this architecture and that management will tell us everything that has any kind of impact on your primary scope. Now, all of those things we've talked about establish boundaries, the space around which you work. They build the walled garden. And when I go on gap assessments, when I talk to clients who are doing high trust for the first time, they often ask me, well, why do we want to reduce scope? Why do we want to make scope smaller? Um, why do we want to so strictly define the scope that we're placing in front of you, especially for smaller entities? where they may only have one primary process. And the point of that is demographics. Once you have taken your system boundaries and truly drawn in exactly what it is you want to certify, you can begin to talk about the demographics of that particular scope. These things, these six primary entities, organization type, entity type, factors, geographical factors, system factors, regulatory factors, they determine your custom high trust scope, your custom high trust set of uh, requirement statements. I said that wrong. That custom set of requirement statements will then guide everything you're going to do on your path to certification. The bigger your demographics look, the wider your net is cast, the more requirement statements come into your fold. For example, and we'll get into more specific things down the way, adding California code to your regulatory factors in general adds 150 individual requirements to just about everybody's high trust assessment. Truly big entities, if you, are, if you are a large enterprise, that may be actually a negligible ad. But understand that each requirement statement has built into it a minimum of five individual tests. Your assessor organizations take that into account when they price you, and the effort that is involved on your end to reach compliance goes up dramatically pretty much with every requirement statement you add. In a later webinar, we're actually going to talk about scoring, and you'll see some of those deeper ramifications of why having a lot of requirement statements is kind of a mixed bag. But in terms of ROI and operational infrastructure, lots and lots of requirement statements means bigger and bigger expense, both internal and external. So getting your scoping down to the bare minimum of what it is that you want to certify really matters, and it can be the difference of twenty dollars and $30,000 just to start with on the assessment external pricing, much less the additional work effort inside that's impossible for me to calculate. As a rule of thumb, as you all are doing your own scoping and your own demographics, every requirement statement adds between 8 and 30 man hours to fully implement each requirement statement. Now, if you already have it fully implemented, of course, that time is not present. You just have your time for self-assessment, which is part of the assessment anyway. But if it's not there, you might have a week for requirement statement of man hour time to get it done. So keep that in mind as you're building your scope. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to walk through these demographics. And here's where it gets a little dry and boring. But bear with me. I'm going to go as far as I can and try to keep the time together. Again, if you have any questions, please throw them up in the QA. Um, and we'll try to reserve a little bit of time at the end of the presentation for any additional questions you might have. Let's talk about organizations. 
Now, as a general rule, most of you are going to fall into the category of service provider IT or service provider non-IT. Now, I notice in our attendee list, I'm seeing uh, a few other entities that may fall into other pieces. I hope you all will forgive me. And if you reach out to me individually afterwards, I'll be glad to kind of tell you where you uh, fall uh, on your entity type. But most people today fall into one of these two categories. An IT service provider is just that. This is IT services, infrastructure as a service, hosting, managed services. Your actual IT infrastructure uh, is the service that you are providing to an entity. A non-IT service provider is all the rest of it. This is your data services, your CRM, your processing, any sort of data processing or real work with the data that's coming through your systems falls into the service provider non-IT category. There are only a few demographic differences between these categories and every other one, but I think most of us can get an idea of demographics from the core demographics that are involved with these two. So your organizational factors. Organizational factors are the core of the audit. They drive almost uh, probably the first half of all of the requirement statements that come in. They are specific to your type, and for most people, they represent the number of records you could lose due to a catastrophic breach. Let me re-emphasize that. Number of records you could lose due to a worst case scenario, absolutely catastrophic breach. That is a specific definition given by High Trust for this particular entity. Um, a large insurance provider might hold a heck of a lot more lives than 60 million. However, depending on how their systems are segregated, how you've defined your initial scope, many of those records may not drive your requirement statements for the system that you're trying to scope in. Additionally, it has to be a truly catastrophic breach. Remember that we're not talking about things that are encrypted so people probably can't get into them. That's not good enough. But we are talking about if every system that you have within your or scope as defined gets somebody on it, what can they walk out the door with? So subdividing databases doesn't really solve your problem. You still have to add all of those records together. It's also worth noting that unless you take precautions to do things like isolate backups or other systems like that that create copies of your data, the copies may count towards the overall total depending on how it's all laid out. Losing the same record twice doesn't really count for more records, but if they can get your backups and that would be encompass your entire scope, whereas if they pulled individual databases, it wouldn't, the backups become the determination of your scope. And let me clarify that a little bit more. If you have the same record in five places, well, it's the ramifications of it getting lost in those places, not counting as five separate records. If there are 10 million total individual healthcare records in your system, representing 10 million United States citizens or world citizens or EU citizens or whatever that happens to be, it doesn't matter how you have those. If you've copied it 10 times, it doesn't make any difference. The actual breach is 10 million records, just like you would report to the DHHS in the event of a breach. You notice that the categories are less than 10 million, between 10 and 60, and more than 60. That's it, that's your fundamental breaks. Less than 10, 10 to 60, 60. It is high trust belief that the risk model around less than 10 million records is pretty much the same whether you have 1 million or 9 million records. Between 10 and 60, uh, you're gonna add an extra layer of controls. More than 60, you're gonna add more than that. Now, a word of caution, if you are familiar with the CSF, this does not equate to level one, two, and three. It has almost nothing to do with that. So kind of keep that in mind as you're going forward. The levels are largely independent of these three items. That said, 
if you cross that 60 million threshold, you're looking at a whole bunch of level three controls. Now, once you have determined your organizational factor, you start on geographic factors. Where are you? How many states are you in? Do you offshore data or are you operating as an offshore entity? High Trust is United States focused. Um, I suspect that version 10 may see a little bit of a change in this particular factor. Um, we really won't know until version 10 drops, so don't count on anything one way or another. But with High Trust aiming itself to more of an international focus, it's quite likely that this might change a bit. But the idea is, is how do you operate? And note that this is where collection, processing, maintenance, use, sharing, dissemination, or disposition occurs. It's a tricky one because it doesn't mean you have clients in every state. It is where are your operations and how do your operations work? If your collection is all centralized in, let's say, Texas, and your offices are all centralized in Texas, and your maintenance systems are all based in Texas, and your entire company is based in the state of Texas, I don't care if you have 48 states worth of information, you're still a single state entity. You only become a multi-state entity when you do things like have management in New York State, you've got data in Texas, you copy your data to Seattle. So the bigger your entity becomes, the more transmission you have between locations, and that's what they're looking at here. There are more points of failure, more things that need to be protected, and we're looking closer at how you move data from one direction to another. So your geographic factors derive a lot of level two and level three controls around moving data from place to place or connecting to it remotely. When you go offshore, you get a whole nother swath of questions around privacy. So kind of keep in mind that there are ramifications there. Now, that is because moving HIPAA data off of the United States shores is a big deal, which you guys already know that, and they're gonna bring in controls to make sure that you guys are adequately covering yourselves for those big deals. That said, um, I have, with all the clients that I've done high trust for, I've only very rarely seen one pop up offshore. Most people fall into the multi-state category. Again, your boundaries are important. I don't care if you have a Frankfurt sales office, if you never do any of this collection, processing, maintenance, use, sharing, dissemination, or disposition of data in Frankfurt. Where your data is processed or worked with determines your geographic factors. System factors. Now, if I said that the first half of your questions really come out of your demographics, maybe even a little bit more than that, uh, the core demographics that, and the number of records that you're holding, the system factors determine everything else. Um, this can add as much as 25 or 30% to your audit, depending on how you answer. And they literally are just a series of yes or no questions each one of those questions targets something in security that core demographics and locations of your services really don't. They're pretty obvious when you look at them. Answering yes brings in requirement statements, and if you want to talk about one of the biggest reasons to limit, limit scope, this is it. First question, can I get to your system from the internet? This isn't talking about, you know, direct connections to clients. If you're using MPLS or VPNs to pull in data, that's one thing. Crossing the public internet is okay. That doesn't actually make this a yes. A yes. This is, can I get into your APIs publicly? Are they on the public edge? Um, do we have any sort of direct transmission like FTP servers and all the rest that move data between your clients and you? This is not, if you look a little bit farther down, public accessibility across the internet, though it is a precursor to that. And as such, things like patient portals, web front ends, um, accessing your system through any sort of web edge uh, presence does trigger the top. That does trigger you to say yes on this. But eh, 
if you limit things by whitelisting, if you determine what IP addresses can connect to you, if uh, client APIs are heavily protected and is somehow um, limited in scope to what they can touch, generally by whitelisting, then this might not trigger your accessible from a public location. Is your system accessible by a third party, not a client, but by another entity that you're using to perform services within your environment? You guys got a contractor that handles managed services and patches your servers? Um, do you guys have an AWS consultant that comes in and helps you build out systems and build those gold masters? If you are using another company or third party to help you out, third party devs, then this goes yes. And there are certain security ramifications around that that immediately come into scope. Do you transmit or receive data with a third party or a business partner? You'd be surprised how many people actually don't. Um, they get their data in in different ways through unexpected directions. But the vast majority of people are going to answer yes here. You're getting your data from somewhere, and it's usually a connection to either a business partner or someone you're sending data out to. If you're using a clearinghouse, for example, that's a third party, whereas a business partner is generally speaking your clients. But don't forget things like required Department of Health reporting, DHHS connections, insurance companies, um, CDC. All of those things do come into the, into the picture. Again, terrifically important reason to limit your scope, to certify the thing that you need to certify. We want to keep that as small as possible, too, for testing purposes, because the bigger that is, the harder that is to test. Can I get to your system if I'm sitting in a Panera? That really is what this question is. If I can access your system from the public Internet, well, there's a lot of security that goes into that. That means you're publicly facing, you're more of a target, um, your system is sitting there on the outside edge, you should be doing vulnerability assessment, penetration testing. That's kind of a big deal. That brings in a bunch of requirement statements. And finally, do you use mobile devices? Mobile devices don't have to leave your environment to be considered a higher security risk and are treated separately in every risk assessment that I've ever done. So kind of keep in mind that anything we classify as mobile, laptops, tablets, phones, your wristwatches, you know, smartwatch, if your company gives you a smartwatch, anything that could be carried out of the facility that uses Wi-Fi causes that to go yes. It doesn't matter where that actually falls in the environment. Some other ones. Now, these are a little bit different. They don't add a lot of requirement statements. They do add a few. But generally speaking, that first set of demographics that we just did, that first set of questions, um, are going to cover most of the requirement statements that pop up in these. However, you are required to state how many connections you make to another company. This isn't an FTP session. This is MPLS, VPNs. This is how do we connect out to get and receive data. The numbers are 25, 25 to 75, 75. So 25 and 75 are your cutoff points. Um, multiple connections to the same source, but to different, uh, uh, to different endpoints count as separate connections. So if your company has one firewall that connects to another firewall, it doesn't matter how many ports you connect to on those particular firewalls, that's one interface between those two systems. How many people use your system? Both kinds of users, guys, both your internal users of those systems and any clients you have getting into that system. This is both from your web front end and from your administrative back end. Add them all together. If you've got fewer than 500, you're in pretty good shape. If you've got 500 to 5,000, you're going to have more controls that get layered on. Greater than 5,000, uh, High Trust begins to consider you an enterprise for connectivity purposes and starts to put very strict controls around things your clients can do. So things like client reporting start to pop in, um, expiring client passwords start to pop in. 
And then finally, the hardest one of all is number of transactions per day. A transaction is defined just like you see there, a database read or the lookup of a patient. Any time we touch a system and, move, and transact with it to get data and put it to another spot, I don't care if that's visual, I don't care if that's a big giant update statement, any time that we're moving data around that network, that's a transaction. This can depend on how your application is built. But remember that every time we make a database connection, we increase our risk. That's how High Trust sees it. That's where this risk model comes from. So if you have a giant system where the database reads a new select statement for everything that builds your web page, chances are you're going to have a high number of transactions per day. And if you think about it, there's risk, but the raw number of transactions are very high. Uh, 6750 is generally speaking, uh, any sort of data intensive application is going to fall above 6750, but 85,000 a day is a lot. You're going to see that with big insurance companies. You're going to see that with um, high transactional databases. You're going to see that in places where there's a lot of data read write, data IO. But it takes a great deal of effort to break 85,000. You're, you're going to be a truly substantial application when you're talking about that kind of number. Now, the thing about that is, is that uh, we've looked at, when you're looking at all these demographics, you can see that they're not relevant to a company as a whole. That's where we start keep harping on this idea that High Trust wants to test systems. They don't want to know your total number of database transactions across your entire enterprise, which can blow 85,000 out of the water for a small entity, depending on what you're trying to do, depending on the databases that you have. They want to know it for a system. Those have a lot of meaning at that point for a system. They don't have a lot when you talk about a complicated environment, again, looking at a hospital as our, uh, as our kind of baseline, they, they can certify a hospital, but you're gonna, you are definitely going to take all of these and ramp them up to 11. Number of records held ramps up to 11. Everything that you do at that point becomes tremendously more complicated. Instead of focusing on your assessment around a much smaller piece of your entity where the controls don't have to be as grand as they are across the entire organization. Um, anecdotally, before we move on to the regulatory factors, I have one client that's a print shop. They're absolutely wonderful client. They do a lot of uh, EOD, um, EOB printing, explanation of benefits printing. Um, to do that, they have a HIPAA line inside of their print shop. They have very, very good controls over managing that line. However, because we didn't do a great job of limiting their scope in the beginning and we went to certify the whole entity, they ran across a requirement from High Trust that said all systems have to go to a lockout screen in two minutes and have to close down your network session in 15 if, you're use, if they're idle. I don't know if you guys have ever seen a giant printer running uh, giant print runs, but these things pull from a central print server and the operator who's running it might be standing there working that machine for three hours while it runs thousands of pieces of paper and he never once touches that computer. But the computer that's running the printer shows him the status of his line. Needless to say, if we had implemented that control, we would have actually blown this guy's business up. So he actually had to work very hard to pass other controls when if we had limited his scope, that never would have been in consideration. If he'd certified his protected line instead of his entire business, we never would have had to deal with that as a particular requirement statement and all the ramifications of not being able to do it. So keep that in mind, the narrower your scope, the better off you are. Regulatory factors. Now, you've built your high trust assessment, you haven't even considered regulatory factors yet, and you're looking at, on average, 300 or so requirement statements. That's generally speaking what you get when you go through the beginning of this. Um, my clients these days have ranged from 280 to as many as 450, 500 off of initial scoping when we are sure we've gotten their scoping right. Scoping demographics can, uh, I'm sorry, regulatory factors can double that number very, very, very quickly and can very quickly 
take your assessment from being, okay, I can manage that, to, oh, wow, what just happened? This has gotten really huge. To put that in perspective, a PCI rock, if you are familiar with payment card industry report on compliance, represents about 1,100 individual tests. 350 requirement statements represents right at 1,700 individual tests within high trust. And those are going to be customized to your environment. They're going to be a little different for every person, but the number tends to stay pretty consistent. If you double that, we go to 600, 3,500 individual tests exceeding the difficulty of a PCI rock by a factor of three. That's brutal if you've ever been through a PCI assessment. That is absolutely a brutal assessment to have to go through. However, every regulatory factor is completely optional for certification. You want to make a regulatory assertion. I am PCI compliant. I conform to the FTC red flags rules. Um, I am Texas state law compliant. Then these are assertions you can make in your report by adding those regulatory factors. Believe it or not, if high trust is gonna be your primary method of reporting compliance, this can be a great way to add a certain amount of assurance to that report for clients that are looking for a little bit more depth. Understand that combining high trust and a SOC 2, which is something that you can do these days, will in itself pretty much double the number of requirement statements, not by adding individual requirement statements on the certification set, but rather bringing in every single requirement high trust has, uh, every single control high trust has, instead of just the subset for certification. So there's ramifications across the board to adding factors to your, uh, to your assessment. But reporting to clients becomes a very nice this is where you get the audit once, report many methodology. That you should only choose these if you need to report them to a client or want assurance around your own compliance with whatever regulatory framework is of interest to you. Now, this next slide shows you a broad sample of many of the regulatory factors, but if you want to know the truth, we ran out of room. There's a lot more here. The big ones for you, though, are the state law requirements. That is where high trust truly, truly shines. It also does a great job with NIST and FISMA. So those are lovely to be able to report on as well. HIPAA is very good as of version 10. HIPAA is an add-on, not a baked into the assessment. So HIPAA is great to report on. If you're interested in high trust right now, chances are you're dealing with healthcare in some fashion. So reporting on HIPAA isn't too much of a stretch. It doesn't add a lot. GDPR is pretty good, but it works better if you're doing a full assessment rather than just a certification assessment. The full assessment brings in privacy controls, and most of GDPR surrounds privacy. Um, don't quote me on this one, but ENAC is apparently related to that certification. Um, we are still getting more data about how that ENAC piece works, but if you're interested in ENAC certification, as I understand it and as my understanding goes right now, that actually kind of leads itself towards that certification. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you're not interested in it, it's definitely a very narrowly tailored certification process. The ones that you should be wary of, uh, take this from a guy who helps people build these all the time, PCI DSS, it is not the equivalent of a rock. If somebody's demanding a rock from you and you try to use high trust to cover that particular hole, it's not going to do it. Um, the rocks are much more complica complicated and much more straightforward around what they're looking for. And while they do a great job of catching most of the requirements, the PCI Council has not determined that it's, it, that's an effective equivalent. Talk to the person who's asking for it, see if they'll go for it, and uh, work it from there. FedRAMP, you will not get a FedRAMP certification doing high trust by itself. I am not equipped to speak to all of the details on FedRAMP, but that is a very deep, very detailed process that takes multiple years to do. And while the CSF can be a wonderful stepping stone on your way to FedRAMP certification, it's not gonna get you across the finish line. You got more work to do than just what FedRAMP puts out there. 
Um, the other one that I want to flag is GDPR. Again, remember, it's at its best when you're doing a full high trust assessment. When you are doing just certification, GDPR coverage is not complete. It's pretty good, but not complete. So guys, some conclusions for y'all. High trust scoping is going to drive your work effort. And it's a big deal. Again, we have barely scratched the surface of how far down the rabbit hole this goes. And it is arguably your most important activity, the single most important thing you're going to do as an entity pursuing high trust certification. If you get your scope right, your work effort, as measured by number of requirement statements, narrows to its bare minimum for your systems. Now, we're speaking about certification, and I'm speaking about it um, a bit like it's taking a test. And certifications kind of are. That, that is what a certification is. Narrowing your scope to report to another person for certification purposes means that only that one little tiny piece will be certified and we can offer no assurance outside of that. Understand that the CSF can be used to offer you assurance outside of that piece. But when we're talking about cost benefit for certification purposes, I'm not sure it's present. That's a decision you guys are going to have to make as an entity. I have several clients who have adopted the CSF as their company-wide uh, compliance framework. And it's wonderful for that. It really absolutely is. But the question becomes is how do you want to assess that? Do you want an assessor coming in and poking at all of those pieces? The expense worth it for you? Does it make sense for your goals in compliance? Or would you prefer, say, a SOC 2 where the assessor comes in and uses the CSF controls to validate your SOC 2? That can also be done. So your actual product, the actual thing you want to be build is going to be commensurate with your company goals and what you want to accomplish. And you can determine the difference in effort by good, accurate scoping to start with. To put that in perspective, when we go out on a gap assessment, a uh, gap assessment with high trust for us usually takes three and a half days. And we don't touch every single requirement statement. They're, they're just too many to cover in anything less than a couple of weeks. But we teach you how to work through a high trust assessment. We teach you how to score. We show you how to read requirement statements. And we work with you at the back end for individual ones that have troubles. In that four days that we set aside for that gap assessment, I will spend a day and a half working with the entity to make sure we have scope right. Even then, going to assessment, we often find adjustments to scope, especially as you start self-assessing and realizing that there are additional systems you missed along the way. Every change to scope changes your requirement statements. It's incredibly important to nail it down early in, the, in, early in your compliance journey and to make sure you understand exactly what goals you're trying to get out of high trust. So folks, I talked fast. We got to the last 15 minutes of the presentation. I'm not seeing a lot of questions in the Q&A yet. Um, if you have any questions for me, please throw them up there. Uh, I know that we covered a lot of ground, and I hope it was useful to you. Um, let me know. Yeah, um, as those questions are coming in, I forgot to mention at the beginning that you will be receiving a CCB CEU for this. So look for that in your inbox tomorrow from our team. Um, we do have one question, Shannon, about um, high trust and Mars E regulatory factor. <laughs> um, I am not a per I am not an expert around Mars E, but this is what I can tell you from what I know. Uh, Mars E is fairly well represented. When I have added it for a client, uh, remember that it's up to you guys to determine what regulatory factors make sense for you. They were very, very content with the controls that it looked at. Um, and as I understand it, it is both fairly represented and fairly complete. It does not offer any form of certification for Mars E, which I am led to believe is out there. That may be expressing my ignorance on that particular subject. 
Um, but it will, it will make your high trust report contain a statement that says, at least as far as assessed, the client is uh, the con constituent agency ha is compliant with MARSI standards. But I think my best thing I can tell you on there is I've had absolutely no one complain about content. Whereas for FedRAMP, which again, uh, there's, a, there's a limit to my understanding of FedRAMP as well, but where I've worked with clients that have gone through the FedRAMP process, one of them literally back to my face is this is not gonna get you there. So my clients have been very vocal about what works and what doesn't inside of the regulatory factors, and they've been pretty happy with the MARSI experience so far. Great. Um, Shannon, could you also just talk about, as someone looking at assessor firms and trying to decide who they want to go with, what should, uh, what scoping questions should they be asking? You know, how should an assessor firm be helping uh, a client scope their engagement? Um, in my opinion, an assessment firm should look at you and begin the entire process with questions around scoping. You should be hearing it from sales. You should be hearing it from uh, every moment that you're engaging uh, with, high, with, with this high trust assessment. It should be the first question you get asked as you get moved along. You know, first your salesman's gonna ask you, then your auditor's gonna talk to you about it, maybe company management, as you get involved with that assessment organization. It should be at the forefront of every conversation up until the audit actually starts, until you've brought that assessment organization in and they're going through those controls. I can't express how big a deal it actually is. Um, I have seen audits turn on a bad scope. And by that I mean we get halfway through it and then suddenly discover that the scope was twice as big as everybody thought it was due to some errant connection that cannot be remedied over the course of it. And it takes that assessment and turns it from, okay, everything's going great to absolute panic for six months. Remember that the amount of work you're going to do to become high trust compliant is dependent on your scope. So the assessor organization, in my opinion, should be working with you from the moment you decide that you're gonna go for high trust certification till the moment you finish, so that we can help you understand what every decision you're making does in terms of scope. And we can catch these things before they go crazy. Remember, we have to learn about your organization too. And it's better for us to do that early than it is for us to wait until the very first day of assessment and then suddenly discover, oh dear, look at that. That one connection just brought your entire corporate office into scope when we weren't expecting it to be there. And that has ramifications. Great. Well, I think that wraps up our questions for today. If you think of anything else, please email Shannon, his email's on the screen now, or if you already have my email in your inbox, shoot that to me too. Um, last month, we had a webinar on what to expect from your first high trust assessment. So if you're interested in that, that is online. And our next uh, webinar will be in about another month, and I believe that we're gonna talk about executive charters. Um, we'll have one per month for the rest of the year, so keep a lookout for that. We also have GDPR topics coming up and a business continuity and disaster recovery webinar, so look on the website for those. And thank you for joining us today. Thanks, Shannon. Oh, no problem. Uh, it does look like we have one more comment from uh, Jean, uh, Jeannie. I'm sorry if I say your name wrong there. I'm going to say Jeannie, and if I get that wrong, throw things at me. Um, it's a discussion about how high trust was established, and uh, it is worth mentioning as we talk through all of these pieces that high trust is not a wholly independent standard. It was, in fact, created by uh, large payer organizations, healthcare. Uh, she brings up um, Highmark, Anthem, Humana, and all the rest, and that is a true statement. They are the ones that have put it out there. Um, what I can tell you about as, a, as an assessor is that I always find myself equating it to the PCI rock. The PCI rock was created by the major card brands for the express purpose of uh, tr kind of covering them, making sure that uh, regulatory compliance was managed by the brands rather than going to law, uh, getting, getting through Congress and having things come down on their heads. They are a self-regulating industry and that's why that standard was created. Um, to that end, the PCI DSS is a widely adopted standard created by a handful of people with definite some serious special interest in it. 
As an assessor, I can tell you that while I have my, I may have my issues with the council, the standard's good. It really does help you to protect that data. And considering that we don't own credit cards, I guess they really deserve to have a bit of skin in the game. High trust was created um, in a lot of ways, although it postdates, uh, it predates the Anthem breach. But a lot of what's in high trust these days is because of that early Anthem breach that really brought healthcare IT to the forefront. The High Trust Council um, itself is an operating entity trying to put security out there into the world. I think their motives are a little bit better than the councils, than the PCI councils are. But you should always take any framework and any standard with a grain of salt. It should have a return on investment for your organization. And I can't speak to how they created it or for what reasons. I can only speak to the CSS, CSF as it currently stands. And what I can tell you is based on ISO, NIST, HIPAA, SOC 2 frameworks, every framework that I have ever touched, the CSF is not a bad way to manage your risk and compliance. If they'd gone off the deep end and made it crazy, then that would be one thing, but it is simply a best practices setup. Um, it tells you prescriptively how to do each control in the same way I would pretty much come and tell you, sitting down across from you, if you were asking me how to build that particular control. And if, if, C, if the CSF has any strength, that's its strength, is it helps you to take that risk model and make it make sense in real world terms on how to do the thing, whatever that thing is. And the CSF was designed to be as complete as possible. It talks about everything from talking to police to building a server. Whatever its motivations, it's not a bad standard. Whether certification or assessment is right for you is a decision I cannot make for you. There has to be a real business need. I will tell you that high trust certification is neither inexpensive nor e it is neither, ex um, can't get that metaphor built right, it's expensive and difficult. It is, I'll tell you, I'll tell you, it is both. This is not an easy journey you're embarking on. On the far end of it, though, you will be more secure. How far you need to go down that path, how much you want to embrace it, whether you want to pursue certification or whether you want to use high trust as a compliance standard, those are all decisions you have to make internally. The only thing I can tell you, as a guy who pays them a lot of money to be certified, and that doesn't necessarily make me the absolute happiest camper, I can tell you that the standard is actually quite good. I'd put it up against ISO. I'd put it up against NIST. After all, that is what it's derived from. But whether or not your compliance journey uh, takes you to certification, well, that's up to you guys and how it fits into your business model and what your clients are expecting of you. Thanks for commenting on that question, Shannon. Um, like I said, if you have any other questions, please send those our way and we'll be happy to answer those over uh, email. Everyone have a great rest of your day. Thank you, folks.